Welcome back. We discussed last week that we can design more efficient codes by looking at longer blocks of the data so that we are able to uncover the structure in the data. A similar statement can be made when you discuss quantization. If the data are correlated, for example, as we'll see in a motivating example when we are quantizing the data representing the height and weight of an individual, we benefit if we do not quantize the height and the weight separately, but instead treat the two elements as a two-dimensional vector. We can therefore adapt the quantization to the distribution of the data. There is no need, for example, to have a reconstruction level for people that are seven feet tall and weigh 40 pounds, simply because such people do not appear very often. We discuss a procedure for designing a vector quantizer similar to the Max Lloyd procedure we covered in the last segment. It is actually referred to as Generalized Lloyd Procedure, or LBG, after Linde Buzo Gray procedure. Vector quantizers have formed compression algorithms on their own, but also they can be used as the middle block of any compression scheme. So, let us proceed with this interesting topic. We saw earlier, when we discussed lossless compression, that a lot can be gained in compressing data when you consider blocks of data at once, since this allows us to reveal the structure in the data. We can do the same with quantization. The vector quantization procedure is shown in this block diagram. It is a rather straightforward procedure. Given a one-dimensional or a two-dimensional signal, such as an image, a number of samples or pixels in a small block are considered at once, and they are grouped into a vector. So when we deal with images, we can consider, for example, a 2x2 two two or an 8x8 eight eight block, in which case we have a 4x1 vector in the first case and a 16x1 vector in the second case. By the way, in different contexts, these two-dimensional sub-blocks are also referred to as patches. Then, during encoding, a codebook is used, able to represent well vectors that we encounter in any image, or maybe in any image belonging to a specific class of images. The distance of the vector to be quantized to all the vectors in the codebook is found, using, for example, the Euclidean distance metric. And the one vector in the codebook that is closest to the vector to be quantized is used as the reconstruction value of that vector. Each vector in the codebook has an index, and it is this index that is used for decoding this vector, or this is the index that is sent to the decoder. So if this is, let's say, the chosen vector, this will be the index that will be sent over to the decoder. Decoding is actually very straightforward since it consists of a lookup table. We look for the vector corresponding to this index. So this is the index that was sent over, and therefore this is the vector that will be pulled out to reconstruct the encoded vector. When we deal with image blocks, then we need to turn the vector into a block, and this is represented by this unblock operation. Clearly, the decoder has the identical codebook as the encoder for this to work. What are the parameters defining the efficiency of the vector quantizer, or the VQ? It is the length of the vector to be quantized, as well as the length of the codebook. How many entries does the codebook have? So, for example, if we consider patches or blocks, let's say, of size n by n, and each pixel here is represented by b bits, and if we assume that the length of the codebook here is capital L, and let's say capital L is 2 to the L, this means I need L bits to represent all the entries in the codebook, then the efficiency or the performance or the compression ratio of this VQ is simply n by times n times b divided by L. This could be called 
the rate also. So let us now further motivate the benefit of utilizing vectors instead of scalars for quantization and then discuss how to design such a codebook. In motivating the use of a vector quantizer, suppose we are quantizing a source that generates the height and weight of individuals. Suppose that the weight varies uniformly between 40 and 240 pounds and similarly the height varies uniformly between 40 and 8 inches. Suppose we have 6 bits to represent each pair of values. We could use 3 bits to quantize the height and 3 bits to quantize the weight. So the weight is divided into 8 equal intervals, each of which 25. And similarly the height is divided into 8 equal intervals of width 5. When we look at the representation of height and weight separately, as is shown here, this approach seems to make perfect sense. But now let's look at this representation in two dimensions. Nothing has changed, the heights are still quantized to the same 8 values and so are the weights. However, we have tessellated the space uniformly. We have quantized values for a person who is 80 inches up here and weighs 40 pounds. So this is a 6 feet 8 inch person that weighs 40 pounds. And similarly, a person who is 40 inches tall and weighs more than 250 pounds, the person up here. Obviously, these outputs will never be used, as is the case for many other outputs. So a more sensible approach is con to consider the quantizer that is shown in the next slide. So here is a view of the vector quantizer. This quantizer has the same number of output points as the quantizer in the previous slide. However, the output points are clustered in the area occupied by the input. Using this quantizer, we can no longer quantize the height and weight separately. We have to consider them as the coordinates of a point in two dimensions in order to find the closest quantizer output point. So clearly, this method provides a much finer quantization of the input. We see with this example that the structure that was uncovered in the data is that they are correlated. However, the vector quantizer is more efficient than the scalar quantizer when the source output values are not correlated. The reason is that when we look at longer and longer sequences of source outputs, we have more flexibility in terms of design. We can now match the design of the quantizer to the source characteristics. Let us look at the toy VQ example. Here is the code book that we have designed. It has four entries and each entry is a two-dimensional vector. I is the index corresponding to uh, the corresponding y of i vector. Here is the signal we would like to quantize using this codebook. Since the vectors in the codebook are two-dimensional, we are going to group two samples of the signal together. So with respect to the first vector 0, 1, we find its distance from all four y1 through y4 vectors. So the distance of 0, 1 from the first vector is 0 minus 0 squared plus 0 minus 1 squared equals to 1. The distance, let's say, from the fourth vector is 1 minus 0 squared plus 4 minus 1 squared 1 plus 9 equals 10. So if we find the four distances, we see that the distance to vector y1 is the smallest one and therefore this vector 0, 1 is going to be represented by the index 1. We do the same for the second vector 2, 3 and we find that it's closest to the vector y3 in the codebook therefore we transmit index 3 and for the last vector 2, 0 we find that it's closest to vector y2, therefore, will transmit its index, which is equal to 2. 
So now at decoding, we are going to reconstruct the input signal by the vectors corresponding to indices 1, 3, and 2, or in other words, this is the decoded signal. And if I find the difference between the original and decoded, this is the quantization error. So this is the simple operation of a vector quantizer, assuming, of course, that the code book has been designed appropriately. And this is now the topic we'll look into, how to efficiently design an appropriate code book. The story when designing a vector quantizer, which really means designing the code book, is very similar to the case of scalar quantization. We saw when we studied scalar quantization that we can design a uniform quantizer, but the optimal quantizer in terms of minimizing the variance of the quantization error is a non-uniform quantizer that matches the PDF of the data. That is, we perform fine, qu fine quantization for the highly probable values of the intensity input values and coarse quantization for the less probable ones. When we derived the Max Lloyd optimal scalar quantizer, we were able to exactly solve for the decision boundaries and the reconstruction levels. Now let's look at these concepts when we deal with VQ. Let's look at the two-dimensional VQ case, since it's easier to describe and visualize. We can always build a two-dimensional uniform VQ, as shown here. The data, the intensity values, however, have an underlying distribution. We saw in the height-weight example that the data lie along a diagonal, that is, they're correlated. So in general, we want to tessellate the two-dimensional plane non-uniformly, as shown here. Actually, you're not interested in finding exactly the boundaries here of each partition, of each region. But instead, we're interested in finding a representative vector, this one, of this whole region. And this is indeed the centroid of this region. So during encoding, if Y is the centroid of this region and we are given a vector X that would like to quantize, we simply find the distance of this vector X from all the centroids in the entries in the code book and we assign X to the closest centroid. So in this particular case, the reconstructed value of X is going to be Y of I. So let us now see how we can partition the space as shown here, or more specifically, how we can find the centroids of these regions. We discuss now a VQ design technique that carries the name of Generalized Lloyd or LBG algorithm, Linde Buzo Gray. We start with a set of training images and also with an initial code book. Based on this initial code book, we partition the space into clusters, R of I, using this nearest neighbor condition. That is, all the vectors close to Y of I, which is one of the entries of the code book, form the cluster R of I. Then, for these formed clusters, we find the centroids of this partition. We then check and see if the energy with respect to the previous uh, step, the energy or the initial distortion, the distortion has been reduced, is below a threshold, we stop, otherwise we go back to step two. So at convergence, we're going to have a code book of size N. This is a parameter that we set ahead of time. And we're going to have these centroids, which will be the entries to this code book of size n. Some general comments here is that clearly the image to be encoded should not be in the training set, otherwise we are cheating a bit. The nature of the VQ is sensitive to the initial code book and the image being encoded, and then in general this algorithm will result in a local minimum, and by and large there is no global globally optimal 
codebook design technique. We demonstrate here the steps of the codebook design algorithm we discussed in the previous slide. Here are the training samples. Each of these squares represents a two-dimensional training vector. We are interested in designing a four-level vector quantizer. We start with the initial code boot vectors, there are four of those, and we apply the nearest neighbor condition. So we find the training vectors that are closest to each of the initial code boot vectors. Based on that, we obtain this partitioning of the space. So for each of these partitions, let's say this partition here, we are now going to find the centroid of this region. By the way, if the underlying distribution is uniform, then the centroid is just the average of the vectors belonging to a partition. If the PDF is known, then it's taken into account in finding the centroid. So again, these are the training vectors, and these are the new centroids for these four regions. We apply again the nearest neighbor condition, and we obtain this partitioning of the space. So the initial code boot vectors moved according to these vectors. For each of these partitions again, such as this one, we are going to find the centroid. And these are the four new centroids. And applying again the nearest neighbor condition, this is the resulting tessellation of the space. These are the resulting partitions and the initial code boot vectors have moved according to the vectors indicated here. So we proceed taking these steps until convergence, until the, the difference of the distortion error rather is below a threshold. Let us look at some simple video examples. Here are two cases. The size of the patch is two by two, therefore it's a four by one vector quantizer, and the size of the code book is 32 in case A and 16 in case B. If we look at the compression ratio for case B, we have again two by two patches times eight bits per pixel, and I need four bits to represent the 16 different entries in this particular case. Therefore, I have a compression ratio 8 to 1. Here are four cases where the size of the patch now is 4 by 4. Therefore, it's a 16 by 1 vector quantizer. The size of the code book varies from 256 down to 32. It goes without saying that while the size of the patch is constant, if the size of the dictionary decreases, the quality decreases as well. So what's the compression ratio for case F here? I have four by four pixels in each vector times eight bits per pixel. And I need five bits to represent the 32 different entries of the code book. So this is approximately 25 to one, the compression ratio. And finally, we have two cases here where the size of the patch has increased. It's an 8x8 patch or 16x1 vector. And the two sides of the code books are 256 and 128 vectors. So the compression for case H here is 8x8, the size of the patch, times 8 bits per pixel. And then in 7 bits to represent the entries to do the 7th equals 128. And therefore, this is greater than 64 to 1. So we see that in case H, we have actually the largest compression ratio for all cases considered. And But the quality is clearly the worst one. We see this annoying blocking artifacts since we don't have enough patches to, I'm sorry, enough code vectors in the code book to describe all possible variations in the patches.